Um, again, I'm I'm Phil Kerr. I am Chief Technology Officer of Prairie uh, Aquatech, uh, a company here in the United States that uh, develops protein ingredients for the aquaculture uh, industry. Um, I too would like to to second uh, Amy's thanks for everyone who's taken time out of their busy schedules to to join the webinar. We think we have some excellent content that we'll turn over in just a second. Um, AOCS is is uh, trying to support developments in this whole area of science and technology of alternative proteins. And alternative proteins can have many uh, categories, uh, but but core to them are are plant proteins. Um, other proteins made by fermentation or during extraction of, of other materials are also part of this alternative protein landscape. Um, and it's all, all important, but uh, one of the areas of key importance is the, uh, the science and technology associated with the proteins that come from various pulse crops. And so AOCS is going to host the inaugural uh, Science and Technology Forum uh, for uh, pulse proteins. Uh, in Toronto, Canada on November uh, 5th through 7th of this year. So its uh, forum is designed to create, create an opportunity to advance both the knowledge sharing and collaboration on all things related to plant proteins, their analysis, their nutrition, uh, applications of them in, in various settings, whether it's food or, or feed or, or nutritional applications. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to learn from leading experts from both industry, uh, academia, and, and government. And they will uh, be in attendance to uh, present new research. And they will also have uh, various uh, town halls uh, forums that will provide various uh, stakeholders uh, with opportunities to, to discuss both current and emerging issues that are key to this very, very important space. Um, if you're interested, I, I would encourage you to go to aocs.org uh, forward slash pulse forum. And I believe we will have that contact information in the links of today. And if you're interested in seeing the content, I really encourage you to to ask questions, um, Amy and, and Dan from the AOCS communications teams have done a terrific job in, in setting up the webinar today and they'd be all too happy to help you both get access to the content and access to additional information on the Pulse Forum coming up in, in uh, Canada later this year. So with that, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you today, Dr. Frederic Baudouin. He comes to us from the Improve Innovation team in France. Uh, he has got uh, significant experience in the area of protein functionality, and this is an area that is oftentimes uh, key to people's uh, interests in developing new uh, applications in the ingredients that can support that. So Frederick has, has developed a nice uh, presentation deck uh, for us all to, uh, to share with him today. And so Frederick, I'd like to turn it over to you at this time. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Phil, for the introduction. Uh, so as you say, I'm Frédéric Baudouin. Uh, I am a food scientist and I am in charge of the protein functionality project at IMPROVE, which is the first um, research and development center in Europe uh, totally focused on plant protein. So before I start my presentation, I would like to thank uh, Amy and Phil and more generally all the AOCS team for organizing this event and uh, also the role um, series of webinars. They're always very interesting and very useful. So today I will give you a short introduction on uh, how to measure plant protein functionality. So uh, firstly, um, what are exactly plant proteins? Plant proteins are protein-rich intermediate ingredients who can be isolated from a variety of plant sources, which can be cereals, oil seeds, pulses, and tuber. Nowadays, the most common plant proteins are gluten from wheat, soybeans, and peas. But many of the novel protein sources are under investigation, such as seaweeds, leaves, and byproducts from the food industry. We are currently assisting to a unique shift in the protein market with the decline of the animal based products and significant growth of the plant based protein alternatives. This phenomenon is not limited to um, big cities and uh, the coast, but it is occurring all across the USA. 
So uh, this means that this trend is uh, uh, is probably a sustainable and uh, long-term trend. Similar uh, trend is uh, happening in Europe too. So this is both a great opportunity and a great challenge for the food sector. Uh, and the reason for that is that it is not uh, easy to um, replace uh, an animal-based protein with a plant-based protein. One of the reasons for that is that proteins are arguably the most complex uh, molecule which can be found in nature. And this has to do with um, high level of structures of proteins. At the most basic scale, uh, proteins are sequence of amino acids, which can be polar, apolar, charged or not charged. And this amino acid sequence uh, has a strong impact on the um, solubility of the protein and uh, on its overall charge in a given pH. These amino acids, they can form together uh, a secondary structure, uh, which is the 3D organization of some segments of the protein, which can form beta sheets, they can form helix, or they can form random structures. All the order structures can tend to give a high degree of rigidity to the protein, whereas these random structures uh, give some flexibility to the protein and the ability to modify its um, shape uh, at the interface, for, for instance. Then the tertiary level of structure of a protein is the 3D organization of the protein as a whole. A uh, protein can form fibrils, uh, like in muscles protein, for instance, or they can form globules, like in dairy proteins or soy proteins, for instance. And if you want to make um, a fiber protein with a, a globular protein such as soy, uh, if you want to make uh, meat, for instance, with soy, then uh, you need to uh, create a high transformation of the, uh, of the structure of a protein, which is why you need extrusion. Uh, then the final level of structure of the protein is the association of the protein chains together. So this ha can happen with uh, casein micelles or another good example of um, a pro uh, structure made of different proteins is, um, is gluten. Uh, gluten is formed of two different proteins, glutenin and gliadins. One of them gives the resistance uh, to extension to the protein and uh, the other one gives the viscosity to the, to the gluten. And the combination of the two makes this very unique structure, uh, which is gluten, uh, which makes it so difficult to replace uh, in bakery products. So taking the example of soy proteins, uh, soy is made of two major proteins, glycinin and beta glycinin Glycinin is an examiner of uh, six subunits and uh, it generally has uh, the capacity to form a strong gel, it has high thermal stability, and it has relatively low uh, emulsifying properties. Whereas in comparison, beta glycinin is a smaller pr protein, it is a trimmer, and it is uh, able to form a transparent soft elastic gel. It has lower thermal stability, but it has better emulsifying properties. And the relative proportion of these two proteins in soy can depend on the growth condition of the, of the soy. It can, so, can also depend on the soy cultivar, which means that all soy proteins are not equal. And uh, in addition to these two proteins, uh, other minor proteins, uh, which are metabolic proteins, can have an impact on the flavor and digestibility of uh, soy protein products such as lipoxygenase, trypsin inhibitors, and lectins. All this knowledge on uh, soy proteins is the result of approximately 50 years of research, and uh, all this uh, research is the reason why soy proteins are so successful in uh, plant-based uh, alternatives to meat. In comparison, we know very little on the structure and functionality of novel source of proteins, uh, which is really exciting because there is a lot to discover 
a lot of new sources to investigate. And uh, perhaps one of these uh, new sources of protein will be uh, the major source of protein in uh, 10, 20 years ago. In addition to the source of plant proteins, uh, the protein extraction method has a great impact on the quality and functionality of a protein. So here's an example of a process, different process maps to uh, produce uh, a protein concentrate or isolate from, uh, from soybeans, but it can be applied to uh, most sources of proteins. So the um, parameters which are going to impact the quality of the final products are the preparation of a grain, the fat extraction method, the protein extraction method, and the post-treatment. So, for example, if you apply a high temperature treatment for uh, remo removal of the oil from the grain, and then apply a simple process just winding to produce your protein ingredients, then you will have a cheap process. You will end up with a product with 50-60% protein content, but the protein will be uh, mostly denaturated. So that means they will have little functional properties. Uh, they will be mostly insoluble, and uh, most of the anti-nutritional factors of the grain will be destroyed. So this makes a great product for feed. Now, in comparison, if you apply a controlled temperature treatment for fat extraction and also drying of your product, and you apply a more complex process for protein extraction, such as the pH metric extraction or membrane filtration, then you can uh, produce uh, a product with a much higher purity uh, and you will uh, isolate uh, protein in their native form, which means they will have higher solubility and they will maintain their functional properties. However, this process uh, of production will be more expensive and the products that you can uh, produce with this uh, type of process will be more adapted to food applications. And this is on this food application that I would like to focus today. So, what are the most um, well, what are the most common functional properties that uh, customers are looking for when they are buying protein ingredients? Well, we can uh, separate them into three big uh, categories: the interaction of protein with water, uh, the surface properties of the protein, and the protein-protein interactions. So well, the first uh, interaction between protein and water are the instant properties of the, um, of the protein. So what happens when you pour your protein uh, ingredients in contact of, of water? So what happens? Uh, do particles cross the uh, interface between air and water easily? That's the wettability. Uh, do particles disintegrate into small particles with gentle stirring? That's the possibility. Do the protein solubilize in water? That's solubility. And when in water, do the uh, particle stays in suspension or do they tend to sediment? That's sedimentation. So all these um, aspects uh, of uh, protein-water interaction are highly important for um, all applications like uh, instant beverages, instant milkshakes, when you want your product to be uh, highly soluble and easy to prepare by the consumer. One of the difference between animal-based protein and plant proteins is that plant-based protein are uh, essentially storage protein for the grain, and they tend to be large, uh, insoluble proteins. So they tend to have uh, a difficult solubility and, and low wettability, low dispersibility. One way to uh, improve that is to apply a treatment on the, on the protein, such as um, hydrolysis, for instance. Another method is to isolate some specific plant proteins, which uh, are more soluble in water than others. Another important protein-water interaction is the ability of protein to absorb water. So in a food system, water can be free. That means it can be extracted but just by cutting or pressing. It can be physically trapped or it can be bound to a, a polar group of a molecule. And so there are different methods to, uh, to measure that, which vary in, uh, in complexity. 
it can be as simple as just pressing and see how much water is removed, uh, centrifugation or nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, protein which are able to bind a lot of water or a lot of oil are desirable in um, some applications such as the meat industry, uh, meatball for instance, where you want to add a product in your formulation which is able to bind a lot of water and to keep it uh, during the cooking so that the end product will be juicy even after cooking. And then another important protein and water interaction is the effect that protein has on the viscosity of the water. So this has an important uh, effect on the consumer perception of beverages, for instance, all the mouthfeel, smoothness, thickness of the product. But it is also important for uh, process uh, applications, such as the pumping, mixing, spray drying stage. They will be impacted if you have a, a protein which uh, is able to uh, alter uh, importantly the viscosity of your intermediate product. So the rheological behavior of uh, of the protein in, so in solution uh, can be measured visually, can be uh, measured with some dedicated process tool, which will give you uh, a value quickly, such as the tan cup or the uh, vascometer. But um, more widely, the uh, the best equipment to assess the rheological behavior of a protein solution is the rheometer. Uh, when you have the viscosity of, uh, of a product in suspension, uh, please be aware that uh, this value of viscosity will depend on many parameters, such as the concentration of the protein in solution, the temperature of the test, and even more importantly, the shear rate uh, applied during the, the test to measure the, to measure the viscosity. If you have a Newtonian uh, fluid, then the viscosity will be independent of the shear rate. But if you look at the blue uh, curve, uh, this is also a protein solution, and the, the, uh, the viscosity of a product is highly dependent on the shear rate. So uh, if a protein provider tells you that uh, this uh, protein has a viscosity of uh, one centipoise, uh, please be aware that it just depends on the condition of the test. So another important properties of protein are the emulsifying capacity. So emulsions are very common in food system. They are dispersion of droplets of a liquid into another, the two liquids being uh, not miscible. Uh, in uh, food products, these two liquids are 100% uh, uh, water and oil. These are intrinsically unstable system which may be stabilized in one way. And uh, a good emulsifier is uh, a molecule which is able to reduce the interfacial tension between oil and water to produce fine oil droplets. And also uh, a good emulsifier should stabilize the dispersed phase against coalescence and flocculation of the oil droplets. And proteins are normally excellent emulsifiers because uh, they are a form of both hydrophobic and hydrophilic sections. And also because of the large uh, size and also of the charge uh, in solution, then they can create repulsions between the oil droplets and stabilize them over time. So one common way of uh, measuring the emulsifying capacity of a protein is particle size analysis. Uh, there you would produce an emulsion in uh, control conditions, and then you measure the oil droplet size distribution immediately after production. And then after a given uh, period of time, you can measure the evolution of the droplet size distribution after one week, one month, or one year. If uh, a protein is a good emulsifier, it will make a very fine droplet size, and also this uh, size distribution will not evolve over time. So this method is very common. Uh, the key thing there is what are the control conditions used for the test. So to make an emulsion, you need to apply energy, energy input to oil and water to form the emulsions. Uh, what is important is that the amount of energy that you apply 
uh, will have a direct impact on the average oil droplet size, uh, which means that you simply cannot compare the emulsifying properties of proteins which have been tested with different equipments or different energy inputs, which means it is very difficult to compare proteins which have been uh, studied by different research labs if they don't use the same equipment to make the emulsions. Another important parameter uh, is the impact of pH on the emulsifying properties of, uh, of a protein. Uh, this is key because pH uh, impacts the charge of a protein, and so it impacts its capacity to uh, create repulsions between the uh, oil droplets. So, for instance, the same, uh, the same protein can be able to form a very stable emulsion uh, at pH 7, but uh, it will not have the capacity to stabilize the emulsion at uh, pH 4 uh, because it would be closer to its isoelectric point. So if you, uh, if you are a product developer and uh, you, you are looking for a protein to stabilize your, your product, uh, please make sure that the, the protein that you are using uh, has a good emulsifying properties at the pH of your application. Another important parameter is the concentration of a protein uh, used to stabilize the, the uh, emulsion. So what you can find is that um, at low protein concentration, the droplet size is limited by the protein concentration. And above a certain concentration of protein, the droplet size is limited by the uh, energy inputs used to form the emulsion. So above a certain point, here 0.5% for sodium casinate, there is no point adding more uh, protein to your emulsion. You won't make uh, a better emulsion just by adding uh, more protein. The, uh, oil, the uh, oil droplet size is just limited by the amount of energy that you apply to form your emulsion. This limit between these uh, two borders is actually different for different proteins. So for example of P, uh, you need to add much more uh, concentration of protein if you want to uh, reduce the uh, size of your oil droplets. Then another surface property of the protein is the ability to uh, stabilize foam. So forms can be uh, investigated just by analogy with emulsion. Uh, the only difference is that the dispersed phase uh, will not be oil in water, but it will be air bubble stabilized in water. But then uh, a good foaming agent uh, has the same property as a good emulsifier. It should reduce the surface tension between air and water, and also it should be able to stabilize the, uh, the foam over time. And so to measure the, the foaming capacity of, uh, of a protein, well, you can do it very simply just by making a foam in, uh, in a Kenwood mixer and measure the volume of foam that you can, fo that you can form in, um, with a given protein concentration. However, with this method, it, you cannot compare the foaming capacity of different proteins made in different laboratories uh, because they will vary in mixer design, speed, and so on. And this will have an impact on the, on the foaming properties of, of your product. Uh, the alternative is to use uh, dedicated equipment. So uh, uh, one uh, device has been developed quite recently by um, uh, by, by a company, um, which is called the Foam Scan. And this equipment is uh, is making a foam in uh, a glass tube, and then uh, a camera is measuring the volume of foam which is produced over time, and a conductimeter uh, measures the uh, the drainage of the uh, of the liquids uh, within the foam. So with this equipment, you can measure the maximum foam volume that you can form with a protein uh, solution and its stability of the uh, of foam over time. So with this uh, kind of methods, then you can compare the foaming capacity of different proteins uh, between different laboratories. Given that they perform the test at the same pH, the same concentration, and uh, during the same test duration. The last important attribute is the gelling property of the, of the protein. 
So gelling is an aggregation phenomenon in which the, uh, the attractive and repulsive forces between uh, the molecules are balanced so that an order network is formed. So uh, gels can be formed by heat. Uh, this is what's happening in, uh, when you are cooking an egg, for instance. Uh, you apply heat to denature the protein, and then this uh, different protein will interact with each other to form an order network. Uh, you can also form um, a network uh, with, uh, during gelification uh, just by not applying heat, but uh, decreasing the repulsions between the different proteins by the use of an enzyme, by, by alterating the pH or changing the ionic force. Uh, the idea there is to decrease the, uh, the, re the repulsion, for repulsion forces between the protein and so that they will slowly aggregate to form uh, an, uh, an order structure. So one way to measure the gelling properties is the least gelling concentration. So this is very common. You will see it a lot in uh, publications. So there you produce protein solution at different concentration. You heat them in standard condition of pH, temperature, time, ionic strength. And then after cooling, you just turn the test tube upside down and you uh, measure the minimum protein concentration to form a gel able to withstand its own weight. So what you can see in this example is that uh, generally uh, animal proteins such as whey proteins are able to form a gel at very low concentration, whereas for plant-based proteins such as soy proteins, you generally need more than 10% concentration to be able to form a gel. So this method uh, is quite useful to measure the uh, right concentration to use uh, for a protein in a product. However, it doesn't give information on the properties of a gel and at which, at which temperature it is able to form a gel. So another method which complements well uh, the, the test tube method is to uh, form a gel in a rheometer. So with this equipment, you can measure the elastic behavior, the solid-like behavior of uh, a solution and the liquid-like behavior of a solution. So what you do here is that you apply a temperature ramp on your, on your protein solution and then you measure at which uh, concentration you are able to, uh, to form, uh, to form uh, uh, a structure which is uh, closer to a solid than to a liquid. And you can do the same for, for cold gel. <clears throat> oh, I think it's a little issue. Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I think you. I think you can now see, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, <clears throat> I think you can now see the, the PowerPoint. Uh, I don't know what, sorry for the technical issue here. So, um, yes, so these are the rheology test. The benefit of uh, rheology measurement to measure the uh, the gelling properties of a protein is that there you can measure the, um, you, you can characterize the gel, you can characterize the um, temperature of a given pH at which we can form a gel. <clears throat> and also you have in, information on the elasticity and also the, uh, the strength of a gel. The limit of this method is that um, the, the information you get on the structure of, uh, of a gel on its elasticity strength are very different from the one that will be applied in real life during the chewing action by the consumer. So it is hard to correlate the result that you get on a rheology test with the result that you get on sensory analysis. 
So the alternative method to uh, characterize the gelling properties of uh, of a gel and the of and the, the capacity of uh, of a protein to form. A good gel is texture profile analysis. So in this method, you apply a strong deformation on the gel, and the idea there is to mimic the chewing action. So during the first deformation of a gel, you will measure the hardness of a gel. And then you apply a second deformation and you will measure how well the product is able to spring back after the first compression and how well it has maintained its cohesiveness. So there you have uh, information which are um, can be used to, uh, to uh, predict what, um, what will be the gel strength uh, and gel properties that will be uh, filled by the end consumer of the product. So if you combine all these uh, all the results from the functionality test, you can uh, score the emulsifying, forming, gelling, uh, water holding capacity of a protein. And what you can see here with this uh, example of uh, scoring between different uh, different proteins is that all the aspects of protein functionality they are not necessarily correlated. So. For example, you can have some proteins, just like the egg white heat, uh, which has very good emulsifying, foaming, and gelling properties, but is not able to uh, hold a lot of water. What you can also find is that uh, there is obviously a strong impact of a source of protein. Uh, an egg white, a salt protein, or a pea protein, they do not have the same um, functional properties, although they are all proteins. And what you can also find is that uh, there is a strong impact on the production method for the protein. So if you compare the soy protein isolates in red and the soy protein concentrates in uh, amber, they are both soy proteins, but uh, one has excellent emulsifying, gelling uh, uh, properties, uh, whereas the soy protein concentrates Y just basically has water holding capacity and uh, no ability to form emulsion, foam or gels. So the take home message uh, that uh, I would like you to have is that protein functionality, they have uh, multiple facets. Uh, it's not one thing. Uh, it is a combination of emulsifying, foaming, gelling, solubility, water absorption. So uh, a combination of many properties. Some dedicated equipment have been developed to measure some aspect of protein functionality, although are highly operator dependent and uh, the use of met these methods prevents the comparison between labs or between end users. Also, um, another key message is that uh, the functional properties of a protein are highly linked with test conditions, such as pH, concentration, ionic strength, and temperature. Uh, I know the ISAS is trying to um, uh, create a standardized method to uh, analyze protein functionality, which is uh, great because that would help us to uh, compare protein isolated in different labs or protein uh, produced by different uh, suppliers. However, uh, we should uh, make sure that the standardized method, they can take into account the impact of a test condition rather than just setting one fixed condition. For instance, is if we decide uh, from now on that all the uh, emulsifying tests should be performed at pH 7, we will never be able to find a protein which is able to stabilize emulsions at pH 5. And some uh, in, some uh, food producers may need uh, an, em uh, an emulsifier which is able to, uh, to work for acidic products. So uh, this impact of, uh, of the environment on the properties of, uh, of a protein, well, we should all be aware of that and uh, make sure that uh, we pick the right protein for the right applications. So that's it for this introduction. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed it. Uh, I know we have uh, a question and answer session. So if you have any question, just feel free to uh, ask. Thank you.
And if you do have questions, since all participants are muted, um, please place them in the chat box and we'll be able to see those and read those for you. Frederick, this is this is Phil. Thank thank you for the presentation. It does an excellent job of introducing what is uh, known to be a very uh, challenging but also very rewarding um, uh, area of food ingredient application. Um, one of the things I'd like you to to give some context or perspective for this audience is that you you presented lots of uh, interesting uh, comparative data from um, one source, uh, single source versus another single source. As you well know, uh, even those single sources are complex mixtures of proteins, but when you get to food products of, of different applications, sometimes you actually use uh, multiple protein sources within the same application. So can you, can you present to the audience the inherent challenges that you face as a food scientist if, for instance, you're interested in uh, obtaining ideal performance and say a mixture of a wheat protein and an egg protein or a, a whey protein and a, and a soy protein um, and, and what that additional complexity brings to the, the challenge of finding the best protein solution for an application. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, I think that you saw from all these aspects of protein functionality that um, even uh, understanding the, the functional properties of one uh, single source of protein is is very complex uh, and that there are hundreds of protein sources uh, which create a lot of complexity for the, the formulator to pick the right protein for the right application. Um, now if you start to uh, mix different protein together then the combination are, are just huge. Uh, so one uh, one possible um, there are many reasons why you would like to uh, blend different proteins uh, in in a recipe. So uh, one one reason one objective would be to um, take the best of the two proteins. Uh, for instance, you can add uh, a protein with high gelling properties to a formulation and one uh, protein with high emulsifying properties uh, in the same formulation to um, to get the, the the specific effect of these two proteins. So this is something which is often done, for instance, uh, if you want to develop sausages, hot dog. Uh, you need a good emulsifier to blend the oil and water, and then if you want to heat, to, to, when you want to produce your, your sausage, uh, you need a good uh, a protein with good gelling behavior. Uh, another way to um, combine protein would be for their nutritional uh, applications. This is a topic uh, which, has, which I haven't covered here, which uh, has been covered very well in the previous uh, IOCS meeting, uh, which, has, which I encourage you to see. Uh, but uh, just in brief, um, the animal protein are generally complete protein. That means that they will bring you all the essential amino acids that you need. Uh, plant proteins, on the contrary, they can be limited uh, in some amino acids. Uh, and so you, you may want to, to mix different sources of proteins, uh, such as cereals and, and uh, pulses, to uh, reach uh, a complete source of uh, amino acids. Okay, we have a question online uh, from Tom. Uh, Tom is asking, cold gels are interesting for clean meat development. Can you give examples which can be made in mild temperatures and mild uh, pH conditions in the presence of salt? Hmm. Well, this is very specific. Um, well, um, you can you can form some cold gel in uh, in presence of soy, um, for instance. Well, native uh, native protein, they are not generally not very good at uh, at making cold gel. Uh, 
um, this is something that we would normally do by um, by firstly transforming, preparing the the, the protein, um, so that uh, by decreasing the pH, you can decrease the repulsion between the, the protein and form uh, and form a cold gel. So, um, because uh, well, more generally, if you uh, if you just decrease the pH in a native soy protein or nat native pea protein, uh, the protein will just uh, precipitate. So um, the um, the advice I would uh, I would give you would be to uh, first create larger aggregates, larger protein aggregates, um, by gently heating uh, the protein on its own, and then uh, this protein uh, at de decreasing the pH uh, of this protein in solution, and then you'll be able to to form uh, a cold gel. Uh, I don't know if I'm very clear, uh, but this is a this is a complex topic, and uh, I, I would be interested to uh, to talk with uh, Tom uh, more specifically uh, to understand exactly what they want, uh, what they what they mean by mild pH and uh, salt condition as well. Yes, well, I think Tom's going to reach out to you uh, via your yeah. your email address that you have there on the slide, and again, that will be provided to uh, to people. So yes, these are very, uh, as you know, well know, these are very uh, complex interactions, and and food is a very complex uh, system for both uh, chemical and physical reasons. So uh, oftentimes it takes a, a significant number of uh, you know iterations in order to get the best uh, system when you're using multiple proteins. We have another question from online. This is from Diana, which asks, which plant proteins are best at emulsifying fat-based systems? For example, water and oil systems. Hmm. Well, clearly the, the, the soy are generally the best emulsifiers. Uh, so I, I, I would go with soy. Um, the most common uh, as well uh, protein that you can find in the market are pea. Well, as a rule, uh, peas are, are less uh, efficient emulsifying properties than soy. Uh, then it also depends on the, how the, uh, the, the protein has been uh, extracted and uh, at which uh, concentration purity has been used. Uh, you can also want to try potato um potato proteins uh given given that they've been extracted under the right condition uh can have excellent emulsifying properties i speak here for the uh, commercially available uh, plant proteins uh, i'm sure um, in the next year uh, very very good emulsifying uh, plant proteins uh, will be found but at the moment, the, the most commonly uh, uh, findable uh, plant-based protein are, are, are these free ones. Okay. Uh, a little bit back to your discussion about nutrition. Um, Andrea asks, is there a relationship between protein functionality and the digestibility of plant proteins? Mm. Well, uh, these are really two different uh, two different aspects. Mm. Well, if there's a relation, I, I would say uh, it's uh, an inverse relation. Uh, normally, well, firstly, plant proteins are a blend of uh, of very different uh, proteins, uh, and well, some some of them, um, the digestibility of the, of the plant protein will depend on the matrix in which uh, it is used. If you have, uh, if your protein is uh, trapped in a matrix with a lot of uh, fiber, then uh, it will negatively impact the, um, the digestibility of your protein. Uh, and well, if the protein is also trapped in, uh, in a matrix with lots of fiber, 
generated, it will have uh, a poor functionality. Then there's no other relation I can think of is that uh, the digestibility of uh, a plant protein uh, can be um, decreased by the presence of what is called anti-nutritional factors. Uh, and among them, there are uh, some uh, specific enzymes, such as the trypsin inhibitors, which uh, acts by reducing the uh, digestibility of other proteins. So there, if you want to uh, remove this uh, activity of the trypsin inhibitors to increase the digestibility of your protein, you need to deactivate them by heat. But the problem there is that if you deactivate the, uh, the protein by heat, you will denature also well, all proteins. And so your, your protein will be less functional. So that's why uh, protein with high digestibility uh, produced for animals are generally heated so that uh, you destroy all the anti-nutritional factors. But these protein are not fit for functional application because uh, all the protein will be insoluble and therefore less soluble and less, yeah. less functional. Yes, another example of the complexity and the compromises that often has to, to, to take place um, Long asks, and a good, great question here, uh, how does the ionic load affect the function of the proteins, just in general? Yeah, well, what uh, the ionic strength does is that um, it will, uh, well, the, the protein in general, um, they can be stable or unstable uh, in, uh, in solution. Uh, based on the specific charge that uh, are on the um, on the protein, um, and so if you add a lot of salt, then uh, they will bind to the uh, negative or positive uh, sections of the protein, and so it will uh, affect this um, well the repulsion between the different proteins, which means they can. Uh, uh, interact with each other and possibly precipitate. Also, well, if you add a lot of salt, then you will change the conformation of the protein. Um, so um, it, it will not be in its um, native state, and this will tend to decrease the, uh, the functionality of the protein. Um, another effect of the, of the salt and unique strength is that uh, it will bind, it will attract the water. And so there's not enough water for to fully hydrate the protein, and uh, so um, the protein will have a less open structure, and also this will uh, decrease the functionality of your protein. Yes, we've seen this many times in um, uh, with with soy proteins, where the system in which you test is vitally important to the uh, to the ultimate answer as to what's the best uh, protein solution. If you're not testing in the presence of the the correct level of salt that might be that would be present in the final application, then you can get very different uh, and misleading results. A good example uh, for example for in soy is beta glycinin, for example. It has some very unique and interesting uh, gelation properties uh, in and of itself, but in the presence of salt, many of those things disappear. And so the answer that you would get uh, in the absence of salt is almost completely different than when you add the levels of salt that would be present in many common, you know, food or food or meat applications. So it's a great question, Long. Um, we have another one um, from uh, Ravender, and and the question here is: Do larger protein aggregates have impact on protein solubility? And if so, will that impact gelation properties? Hmm. Well, I would say it depends on the on the size of your aggregates. If you, if you manage to do small protein aggregates, they will generally be soluble. Above a certain size of aggregates, then uh, they will be sensitive to, um, to gravity and uh, they, they will be uh, uh, they will be less soluble. Um, also, um, it depends on the on the charge 
the overall exterior charge uh, that you um, that your protein aggregate has. Uh, there are some uh, interesting applications um, which are called uh, protein microgels, where you have a protein which is uh, well classically soluble at pH, alkaline or acids, and have low solubility uh, toward its electro isoelectric point. Then, if you form uh, protein aggregates of under specific conditions of pH, ionic strength, etc., you can form protein aggregates which uh, have which will bury their hydrophobic um, sections in the inside of the aggregates and will have uh, the hydrophilic um, sections on the outside of uh, of the uh, of the protein aggregates. And uh, this uh, type of aggregates will uh, normally have high protein solubility in uh, in uh, many conditions of uh, of pH. And uh, with these uh, techniques, actually, you can form uh, some protein which are which have different uh, functionality, either better or worse. Uh, and also, you can form uh, protein structure which are able to to form gel in uh, in the specific conditions of ionic strength or pH. Um, so this is a if you look at for publications with um, uh, the keywords uh, protein microgel, you will find a lot of uh, of work on that, which were originally done on uh, on uh, dairy proteins, but uh, now this work are being done on plant protein as well. Okay, very good. That might be a way to overcome the inherent structural limitations of these larger globular uh, plant proteins when you try to, mm -hmm. to uh, get them to perform like uh, their animal protein, uh, uh, competitive proteins in, in key yeah. applications like beverages and particularly acidic uh, beverages. Yeah, yeah. Right. Very good, very good. Yeah. Well, um, we still have a few minutes, but uh, if we don't see any more questions from the audience, again, we want to thank people for taking uh, time today. Um, and Amy, any last questions or comments that you want to share with the audience on today's webinar? Well, I just want to thank you both. This was absolutely fantastic, as well as thank everyone for joining us. We will send you an email that will contain the recording. And if you should need additional information to get in touch with either of our speakers or about the Pulse Forum, um, please feel free to send me an email, amy.garen at aocs.org, um, and we'll, I'll be happy to get you in touch with whomever can, can best help you uh, find your answer. And so with that, thanks again, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye, all. Thanks for that.